Good morning. Welcome to Krishna's classroom. I am Krishna Kumar. Now we embark on a generalization of the divine nature. Because you recall, we introduced the concept of divine integration and then uh, went on to investigate the relation between the integral and the antiderivative of a function. We also explore the question which functions are demand integrable. In fact, we characterize it in terms of the discontinuities, etc. Then we also found that there is a sizable class of functions like all continuous functions on the interval AB and uh, all monotone functions, bounded functions on the are all remanded. So we, we, we have a, and we also uh, proved the, the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, having completed this task, we now explore which way we can expand on this idea further. In fact, a, we are interested in looking at a possible worthwhile generalization of this concept by introducing the so called Riemann series integral. The, this concept was first introduced by Stillis in the year 1894 a very versatile generalization of the Riemann integral. In fact, Riemann integral uh, comes out as a very special case of this. And uh, it also a vital step which takes us closer to the concept of measure, level measure. Okay. So let us explore this idea. So I am just treading the path of development of this ideas. Now what exactly is the, is the extra thing that comes in here? Because you recall we have this integral, integral A to B, What we define. Remind me. Now what we do is see here on the interval A B we have a monochronically increasing function X. It's a monochronically increasing function whose graph is like this. And we are taking the variation or the integral of Ft with reference to this monotonic function. It's a monotonic thing this. And then of course we got very many exciting results around that. So the next generalization is, is the following. Suppose we replace the function t let me call this function alpha t this is a special case that we have explored what we do is we take a more general monotone function on the interval t and then define almost mimic every act that we did for the Riemann integration instead of the function alpha t equal to t we will be working with a more general alpha so let us start with that function and the advantages are you see very many in fact Vex said worthwhile generalization as a special case this follows not only that you see even things like infinite series or a, a sum can be reconceived as an integral 
using this uh, function, R function. Now let us start with this. So definition. We start with the definition. Let alpha be a monophonic beam decreasing function. Bounded interval. In fact, we take the interval a b as before is a closed bounded or in single term you can put compact interval. On a b. So it is assumed to be monophonic in this. And you see that the special case that we have already worked on, alpha t equal to t, is a monophonic function. What does it mean? It means the following that is for a less than or equal to x, less than y, less than or equal to b, we have. Alpha x is the alpha This is the assumption that we make. So this is more of our thing. This is equal to also. I will give the, we will explore the implication of this further. It's alpha a alpha. We are not assuming continuity, we are just taking alpha to be a monotone function of the interval a b. Therefore, it is it's a bounded function, it is bounded below by alpha a. It is bounded above by alpha. So alpha is defined as a and b. That's a point. Now let us look at this. Something like this. This is from a to b. What happens? Now this is your alpha a. This is your alpha. And for any x and y, alpha x, any x, y between alpha a and b such that x less than y, you have alpha x less than alpha y. Therefore, what it is doing, see alpha is a map from the interval a, b to the interval alpha a. And what more, according to the assumption that we have made, we have said that it is monotonically increasing, which means if you are on the interval AB and then this is the interval alpha A to alpha B, then you have a map alpha here and when you move in this direction, you are moving in this direction. Okay? So corresponding to an X here, you have the point alpha. Now this can be probably understood this way. See, instead of the time interval, 
here constantly. We look at some spacing. For example, suppose you are traveling by a bus. Then it it uh, it starts at the time t equal to a, and then moves forward. Then you know it traverses certain distances, and you measure the distance. The distance is measured as alpha alpha t. So it starts from the point alpha a to travels to the point alpha b. And it is quite possible that this bus could be stopping at some places. First, I will bring in discontinuity later, but before that, I mean just to get a feeling. Okay? So what you have is that the bus could be traveling for a while, stopping for a while, and then again, then stopping and so on. So it is quite possible that alpha is a constant over some part of the time interval. Okay. Let me just use t here. So this is the time interval. So this is alpha t. So maybe it travels for a while t1 and then t1 to t2 it may be, you know, the time will be flowing but alpha your vehicle won't be moving at all. So it may stay from t1 to t2 it may stay at a point and then go on further and so on. So now you see we are bringing in a variation. And also, this alpha may be increasing at different rates at different time. So essentially, we are mapping the interval a b, the time interval a b, to the space interval alpha a to alpha b, with a sort of uh, you know the distance completely redefined here. So giving a new notion of distance on the interval a b. So it is like that. Okay. Right? So corresponding to, now what you do is, you see, you take a new distance motion, see delta on the interval x to y, this notion is now defined as alpha y minus alpha x. As you can see that is if x y is the time slot in which your vehicle is stationary, then you are going to have alpha y minus alpha x equal to zero. Okay, that's the whole idea. So this is the distance, new distance that you give. So let us use that. So what you do is you start with a partition on the interval a. So let x1 less than x2 less than as in the case of Riemann integration now we, we introduce a partition p on the interval okay. now corresponding to the partition and the given alpha see it sets up a set of points you have on the interval a b this is x naught this is x n minus 1 x i minus 1 x i so corresponding to this you have on the interval alpha a to alpha b, it sets up a, a partition. What is a partition? This is something like alpha a equal to alpha uh, alpha x naught for this thing. Then you have alpha x i minus 1, alpha x i. And then this is equal to alpha. So this is the, and this is your alpha, alpha x. So a new, new distance concept is now introduced on the original interval a b. What is the distance concept that you have? We are taking a monotonically increasing. Okay. So the new distance concept is that 
the new distance between xi minus 1 and xi is given by alpha xi minus alpha xi minus it is no more the conventional distance with which we work but we in, we have introduced a new distance concept and this is what we work okay so we also set norm of p to be the supremum or if you want this is only finite set so we use maximum of alpha xi minus minus 1 this we write as now p or if you want you can put an alpha here Something else. We use it. We may not use this. Now, as before, for a given function, okay. So we 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 have given a function f. So let f be a real value. bounded on now for this function exactly as we did in the case of Riemann integration instead of working with xi minus xi minus 1 we work with alpha xi minus alpha xi minus 1 we know that this is 70. Okay. So we have, so let us designate this as delta alpha i. So we have delta alpha i. So it could be 0 also. I mean, this is what I was telling you earlier. Now, for the function f, we define two sums. We define the upper sum as before, u p f alpha, and alpha also comes into the picture, and this is defined as sigma m i delta and l p where m i is the supremum of f x on the interval side and small mi is defined as the infimum of the side of the top. This is exactly as we did before. We took the maximum or the supremum of the function, we use the word supremum here. Yeah. We are using bounded functions, the supremum exists and the infimum exists. There is no problem about the existence of mi and small mi. So we have two sums, what is called the upper sum and the lower sum. Now we define it before. So you see, so you have got the collection of numbers u, p, f, alpha. And another collection of numbers L, P, F, alpha computed for this function F with respect to the partition. For, for each partition you have a corresponding number. So now we define, define. Now one observes that U P F alpha is certainly bounded function. Bounded above. This set of numbers is bounded below also. So also the collection L P F alpha is bounded above. Bounded below. I mean that's quite easy, quite easy to find out because you can see that 
all suppose m and small n so then you can easily show that these are these are a set of bounded numbers this is also a set of bounded numbers okay and therefore the supremum and infimum exists so we have we take the infimum of all the numbers this set of numbers is from the field also okay so we take the infimum of all these numbers and do the notation for the upper integral f d alpha we write f d alpha define this as the infimum of u d f alpha infimum taken over all partitions p Okay. Similarly, we define lower integral we put a upper bar and the lower bar here to indicate the upper integral and the lower integral as supremum over P of L P. Both these number 6 is because you can show that in fact this collection is bounded below ok this collection is bounded above therefore the infimum of this collection exists and the supremum of this collection so we have these two integrals, the existence of these two integrals for the functions that we have started. Okay. So now we can define the following. We say that F is Riemann integral, Riemann integral. With respect to alpha, of this is what is called the Riemann Alpha varies between A and B here, but the meaning of this is this. 
that is x varies over a and b and then this is equal to this over. So let us uh, write it properly and say that this one is right. Okay, this is what is called the Riemann Stilges integral of f with respect to alpha or simply Riemann integral of f with respect to alpha or the Riemann Stilges integral. Yeah, so what were the assumptions? The assumptions were that f is bounded and uh, alpha is monotonic increasing on the interval and uh, what more therefore we get alpha bounded and you see that we define a we introduce a new concept of of distance between points on the interval a b using this alpha and then with respect to that we compute the upper sum and the lower sum and then exactly as in, in, in the Riemann integral now if you replace delta alpha i by xi minus xi minus 1 then you get the uh, Riemann integral the usual Riemann integral okay. now here the caution is that this is not something to do alpha is not a variable this is a symbol this symbol means this one probably and of course x is you can you can also be replaced by g or something like that so essentially it depends on a few things it depends the value of this integral whenever it exists depends on a b f and alpha so That's why we choose to use this notation. Okay. So this X is immaterial, you can also write T there or S there or something. It is immaterial. This integral exists by which you mean this upper integral and the lower integral are equal, then you say the function is integrable. Function f is integrable on the interval a b with respect to alpha. So the role of alpha is very important. Now that gives a lot of flexibility to squeeze in a lot of things into this particular language. Like an infinite series can be shown to be, you know, written in terms of in the form of an integral. If you look at it, what you are doing is a new concept of length has been introduced on the interval AB. As I said, the distance between the points X and Y is given by alpha Y minus alpha Y. You can show that this is greater than or equal to 0 because of the assumption that we have made. Secondly, it is equal to 0 whenever x equal to y that's something which you cannot say always okay. so at, at the moment if you are taking a continuous function yes but otherwise that may be different that i will come to that so alpha i said alpha can can uh, absorb a point and also different possibilities so the versatility that is that can be brought in is something that we can introduce. So first we talk about the existence of this integral. L, E, F, 
alpha is less than or equal to L B star F alpha. So also U P star F alpha is less than or equal to alpha. By which you mean that B is a P star is a refinement of If the set of points P is containing P star, that means every point xi that is there in P is in the new function. So that's what we mean by F5. So under refinement, what happens is the lower sums that you compute start moving up and under refinements the upper sums will start going down so you can refine this with one point so a proof I just give an outline but you do it this refine one extra point Refine P with one point X star belonging to the interval A P X star not in P. Then P star equal to P union the singleton X star is a one point refinement of P. Without loss of neutrality, assume X i minus one less than X star less than Okay. Now what do I have? This is what I have. I have x i minus one x i and I am introducing a point x star here. Now if you look at the following, see. Now we work with the the supremum and infimum of F. What happens to the supremum of F? Okay. So well, suppose you have a function. I'm just taking it now like okay. So you take the supremum on this whole interval, then in this case you see that it is this number. This particular So this you call a number. And if you take the infimum, this is number. Now what you do is you take it on each of these subintervals. What happens is suppose I define like this, then what happens to the upper sum? The upper sum is actually see for the figure that we have drawn here m i1 star is equal to m star sorry m i star but this is certainly lower in this case therefore you have uh, the sum that you have computed here would become smaller so the upper sum starts moving backwards becoming lesser and lesser as you find the similarly when you use the lower sum, you see that the lower sums, the sum of the lower sums here is greater than the sum of the lower sum that you calculate for xi minus for the interval xi minus one. Xi minus that's a simple thing. Now you can assume the same thing is true for k points, then you can also prove. That which is true for k plus one points, and then get the So I leave that uh, technique of proving this to you. Therefore, one can obtain a formula that is integral a to b
So this is something that we have to do. So to prove this, what we do is the following. See, we, we can prove that suppose we make the observation to king use this side. If P1 and P2 are two partitions, Not necessarily one contained in the other or any sense. We are not making any assumption at all. We are just two partitions. Then L P1 uh, F alpha is less than or equal to U alpha. Similarly, yeah, this is the inequality that we can prove. What he says is that all the lower sums are bounded above by the upper sums. Okay? So all the upper sums are bounded below by lower sums. Therefore, you see that if you consider this connection, that is L, P, F, alpha over all partitions, some of the class of partitions of A, B, then the supremum exists because it is called the power. Okay. Similarly, for all these, or I will give it this way, supremum over P, 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 And since this inequality is true, it follows that, see this is the lower integral and this is the upper integral, okay, therefore, still it doesn't say that they are equal as we have experienced in the case of uh, Riemann integral. So uh, it's just concocting an argument starting from here. For P1 and P2, for arbitrary P1 and P2, you prove this. How would one do this? Okay. What is the... I mean, here what you have to use is the following. You know that... P1 union P2 is a refinement of... both use this and allow me this result okay so you get this inequalities and then you get this so therefore if we know that both the lower integral and the upper integral exist and therefore we say that the function is integrable so we say that we find F is alpha or the integral. What we can say in general is that each of these exists and there is this inequality between them as we have seen that here, but not this. Okay, then it's just if this exists, then you say this is not something that you can always be quite sure of. Now, as before, in the case of uh, Riemann integration, we want to translate this into a more uh, manageable condition for this. Now, for that, what you do is, 
we prove an analogous result, that is this theorem. If and only if for every epsilon positive there exists a partition B such that so that's the criteria. I mean this is something very handy to work with because we will be working on finite sums. Okay. Right? And uh, the proof of this theorem is exactly as in the case of prima limitation. Now it is the same type of proof that you have because you see that if the if it is Riemann integer, for example, I mean, just identify, I, I indicate the proof. If f is Riemann integer with respect to alpha, then these two are equal, which in turn means that zero is less than or equal to the difference of these two less than epsilon for any choice of epsilon positive. Assume that. And then you work with this, okay, right, this L and U instead of these integrals and use this fact that the, 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 the what you have is this, that there exists, yes. you see that, assume that this is a integral, then we have What is the connection between U and, and uh, L? See, you have this the following. See, see we have uh, defined the upper integral and the lower integral as the infimum of all the upper sums and the supremum of all lower sums respectively. Therefore, we have this result that see we have L And then uh, you have, uh, you know, see, this is uh, okay. So you can work with uh, integral f alpha because this is the supremum of all LPF and this is the infimum of all these LPF. So you have work u p one f. Alpha minus
can go for refinement of P1 and P2 yes. and this use these inequalities from which you can come to the conclusion. So you compute this and bring it in between this uh, integral f alpha and so on and then get the equality. So that's quite simple. And conversely, if you assume this, you can get it, get it back to the equality. So if, if uh, u p f alpha minus l p f alpha is less than epsilon, then <coughs> you see that this is squeezed between u p f alpha and l p f alpha, and therefore this is if this is less than epsilon, then this is less than epsilon. Okay. So that's So now we state another theorem. There again we just indicate the proof of that theorem and rather than going to the details, you know. These are quite easy exercises that one can work with. Okay, yes. Assume for a given alpha u and epsilon there exists p such that u p f alpha minus yes, so first thing that you can prove easily is that this inequality holds good for every refinement of that's obvious if if P1 is a refinement of P, then you see that U P F alpha is is uh, you know uh, is greater than or equal to U P1 F alpha. Similarly, L P F alpha is less than or equal to L P1 F alpha. So use that and then you get this. So that's quite easy to prove. The second statement is <coughs> if P is given by and a sign here <coughs> are arbitrary points. Si 
Similarly, f of ei is greater than or equal to mi. So mi minus mi is squeezed between f of si, f of si minus f of ti is bounded by mi minus small mi. So use that and then you get this. Okay. So that's the way in which you prove this. The next uh, statement is that <laughs> F belongs to R alpha and the hypothesis for two poles. Then we have the following. See, whether this Ti and Fi are any points that you choose from the interval, Xi minus 1 to Xi. Not necessarily where the function attains its maximum or the supremum or an infimum. Okay, so what you have is then you have sigma i equal to 1 to n yeah, ti delta alpha i minus integral Okay, it's quite easy to prove, it's just quite easy to work with this. <coughs> because you use this fact, so for the proof of the third part, you use this fact. Is a part of the the difference between u and l is less than epsilon, then it immediately follows that mod sigma It's just about bringing it out with the qualities. That I think it should be able to work. So now let me just, as before, we obtain two results that. All continuous functions are Riemann series integrable, and again, all monotone functions are Riemann series integrable. So, let first here, this if f is integral, on a b. Sigma. So this 
So this is equal to sigma into delta alpha or what you have as alpha xi minus alpha so the problem is to get this arbitrary small ok so to get this arbitrary small so you will have to get each one of this arbitrary small because these are common ok so here what happens is that the continuity of f can be made use of to work out your partition so that is the whole idea ok and then also uh, you know combine that with uh, this kind of alpha x i minus alpha x i so what you do is this one. so let let us see how the proof works out so let epsilon positive then choose an eta positive such that alpha b minus alpha a times eta e plus than epsilon. So that is there is no problem. Once epsilon is given, an eta of this kind can be so eta e plus than less than epsilon divided by alpha b minus alpha a. Unless this is zero. So such a choice can be. So once you make this choice, then you see the crucial thing is to manage this sum. Okay. So what do we do? So we use continuity for this. So we are assuming f is continuous. Once f is continuous, so on a b, which implies there exists delta positive such that ft minus f y f x minus f t is less than eta whenever delta. So that is possible. The choice of such a delta is possible. Now what next? What you do is you choose a partition such so that mm. Less than delta, that is xi minus xi minus 1 is less than delta of so that is the condition. Therefore, this is now you just compute this. This we have computed. This is equal to sigma minus one, and that is less than or equal to. See, we have this result that this is less than or equal to eta. And what about this? And this is equal to eta into alpha b minus alpha b and by the 
choice of eta, how we have chosen eta, we have chosen eta such that alpha b minus alpha a times eta is less than Therefore, we have successfully, successfully obtained a partition of p such that this condition is true. So, what you are doing is on the interval a b, you are choosing a partition xi minus 1 xi such that the length of this is less than delta. How do we arrive at delta? Start with epsilon, choose eta, and then for the corresponding eta, you choose the delta using continuity. Now, this is the place where we use the continuity. Because of continuity, we are able to do this. And then, of course, this is true. Therefore, this is Riemann integral. So, all continuous functions are Riemann integrable with respect to alpha. Now, what I want to spend a moment is on this that uh, you see this is the sort of terms that you will have to work with so you will you will have uh, you know f of say m i minus m i alpha s i minus alpha these are the sort of terms that you will have to work with Okay. Suppose, see, to make this small, there are two ways. What are the ways that you have? You can make this arbitrarily small or this arbitrarily small. I mean, this is the product because you know that both are finite anyway. Okay. So, by making this arbitrarily small or this arbitrarily small. So, you see that. Wherever f is continuous, you can play around on this term by choosing the interval xi minus 1 to xi sufficiently small using the continuity as we did in this particular case. Suppose there is a problem of discontinuity. f is discontinuous at some point, some point. Then around that point, Suppose there is a point of discontinuity, I will do some examples later. Suppose this is xi minus 1 xi and this is a point of discontinuity for f. Then you cannot anymore use this argument. So this cannot be made arbitrarily small. In that case, if alpha is continuous here, continuous at that point, okay, then you see that by squeezing this interval is small enough on that alpha this can be made arbitrarily small so it is actually playing around with these two terms either making this small or making this small but if if, if you have a concept that also just uh, indicates that if both f and alpha have discontinuities at the same point, then you are in trouble. Okay? So, if you have alpha discontinuous at some point, then certainly you would require the f to have continuity there. And vice versa. Okay? Right? So, that is an indicator. So, I think I will stop this talk with that and later on we will push this further. I will also take some examples to analyze this problem. Thank you very much.